Marina Severnovsky. Marina is the head of sustainability North America at Schroeder's and leads the sustainability and environmental, social, and governance integration for Schroeder's investments in North America. She collaborates with senior managers on market strategy, client communications, product development, sales, and investor management. Please join me in welcoming to the podium Marina Severnowski of Schroeder's. And do we have the slides? Or? I just want to make sure we have the, the slides. I'll start without the slides. Hi. Um, so I'm actually going to follow up um, from Nikita, who spoke from Lazard. Um, Schroeder is, is a very large asset manager based in London, although we have a big office here in New York, too. We're close to a trillion dollars of mostly institutional money. Um, and we are one of the preeminent, I would say, sort of recognizable brands around sustainable investing at our level, kind of, you know, large size. We're, I think, fourth globally and here in my market, where I cover North America, number three. So. Um, and what I'm going to talk about is going to give you a live kind of case study, effectively what she spoke about, which is that what does it look like when you integrate ESG into investing, um, you know, ESG integration and, you know, for kind of risk analysis and also for better investing um, is what I'm going to talk sort of through for about 10 minutes, and then I'll take any questions that you have. Um, so in the first instance, and I'm very cognizant in the back of the room that these are just pretty pictures, as my kids will say when they look at my screen sometimes, <laughs> so just pretty colors. But if you want the slides, of course, uh, just let me know and they'll be available to you. There's a number of different things that we do when we integrate ESG data um, into our investing. And so, you know, it goes from sort of thematic research that we do on the desk that we share with our investors, um, ESG analysis where we help the investment team sort of think about the most material considerations for the companies they cover, training and monitoring, um, active ownership, which I'll touch on a little bit, a little bit more. But the kind of two things that I really wanted to highlight were, one, what we call truly integration. Um, of ESG considerations into the investment process, and the other one is proprietary tools. Schroeder's has, rather than relying on the third-party tools that are out there, built a suite of over a dozen proprietary tools that our investors use. What's really important is the investors sit in the center of this. So we've made a cultural decision at the firm that we don't compete with our investors. We are a service to our investors. We are going to help them be better active managers by giving them this, this ESG data and insights. They can do their work better. We also offer support directly to our clients through education, collaborative research, collaborative engagement with companies, all sorts of support for their initiatives. But that's our external client, and then the investors are our internal clients. So the first thing I'll talk through is kind of annual accreditation. Every year, we, we basically make every investment desk go through this process uh, where they explain to us kind of how they integrate ESG into their investment philosophy, how it influences their beliefs as investors. Um, how they integrate into their process, so very explicitly kind of risk assessment. In portfolio construction, how do you take a, a decision, how does ESG play a decision, a uh, role in the decision, right, to kind of how you size positions, for example, how you handle poor performers, how you engage with companies and escalate issues, and then we ask them for kind of case studies as well. And speaking about decarbonization here, one of the explicit areas we look at is do they understand climate risk in their portfolios? We help them track temperature alignment of the companies who have made commitments around sort of temperature, um, you know, uh, uh, changes in their portfolios over time. We have a, a net zero dashboard they can put their companies through so they can see what their portfolio looks like from the perspective of sort of net zero ambitions. Um, active ownership is critical, and again, I thought about sort of the decarbonization theme here. You know, for a large asset owner like us or asset manager like us, there's basically a normal curve. At one end of the kind of extreme of the normal curve, you can decarbonize a portfolio by just sort of getting rid of things that are very high carbon emission. This is ultimately not going to do a whole lot, or you can't really do a whole lot of this because we are trying to provide diversified investments for folks. And so if you start dropping kind of whole sectors and industries, um, obviously it's twofold. One is you, you don't necessarily provide the kind of market beta for a client that they need. In, a, in you know an investment and number two is you can get rid of it in your portfolio but that doesn't mean it's out of the world you have just sort of passed the problem along to somebody else um, on the other side of the normal curve are, are climate positive investments which I know a lot of folks in the room will be talking about over the next couple of days and we're actively looking for kind of climate positive solutions uh, for decarbonization carbon capture storage etc 
But all the bulk in the middle of the normal curve is the engagement with the existing companies and helping them down the net zero journey, down the decarbonization journey in their, in, you know, in their businesses. So this is where we can be really kind of active, right? And we use data here too. We identify the companies that we want to engage with most, the ones that have kind of highest priority for us based on both their um, carbon intensity and our exposure to these companies. Um, and, you know, we obviously track the engagements. We want to see how successful those engagements are. Are companies moving down the path more quickly with our support than without it? So this is another area where we integrate ESG sort of data and kind of considerations. Now the proprietary tools I mentioned, right? We have a suite of tools. Some of them are around, and I'll talk about one of them as an example, around how you do investment analysis. Again, another is around sort of the climate risks and opportunities. I talked through a few of those in terms of net zero temperature alignment, climate analytics. Um, we also have an impact measurement. Um, so when you're talking about kind of true impact investing, you know, who is being impacted, to what degree, that's a whole different level of analysis. And then thematic alignment, you know, how um, exposures may align to the UN sustainable development goals. The one tool that I wanted to talk through, because it's quite an interesting one, and this is profiled by the UNPRI, has won a number of different awards, has been in place since about 2017, is our tool called SustainX, and it's a proprietary tool that we built using a thousand plus academic and industry studies. We look at, at 70 different data points for each company. We cover 16,000 companies and 150 governments. There's a sovereign version of this tool and a corporate version of this tool. And what this tool does is it takes a, basically kind of a direction there and then it comes right back. So the two sort of steps that it takes is one, it looks at the extent to which companies in their activities create both positive and negative externalities to people and planet. So here you are, you're a company, you're operating, and you're putting things out there into the world that mostly are negative, and you're not being asked to pay for them yet. The second step back is what does it look like for you as a business when you are going to be asked to pay for that? And so kind of, you know, blunt instruments, right? You know, kind of the carbon tax, sugar taxes, plastic taxes, minimum wage legislation, you know, all those sorts of things. Um, at some point, companies are going to be increasingly required by sort of regulators, governments, society, public opinion to effectively bear the cost of the negative externalities that they create. So that's what we're looking to do is to kind of measure those externalities. A lot of those are, of course, carbon-oriented or kind of climate-oriented externalities and think about the impact to companies and educate companies and educate our investors as to what the actual financial hit from a bottom line perspective would look like for a business if they were forced to cover all of their own externalities, which we think is the kind of ultimate direction of travel. We don't know when or how quickly, but it is the direction of travel. And so we have um, kind of an overlap here between the kind of corporate and the, the, um, the sovereign issues. And in the center there is certainly kind of carbon emissions, as you can imagine. And so this is the kind of analysis that we do. We basically look at it a couple different ways. One is sort of global value. So we define the activity that's responsible for the bad impact. And then we share that cost across companies or sovereigns based on their activity share. Another way to do it is on units. So you kind of quantify or you estimate a level of activity for each company or sovereign. So CO2 emissions is one of those. And then you multiply that level of activity by the social cost of the activity. That's how you figure out how costly it is. And again, you apportion it. Um, and so we, again, can show this to our investors and we can show this to the companies themselves. You know, where are you benefiting the world? You know, um, avoided emissions, um, I don't know, like financial inclusion, power provision, connectivity, good things. And of course, where are you hurting the world? And the number one up there is the carbon emissions. And there's also things like tobacco and alcohol, which have obviously a social ill. So, and then this is the kind of the, the, um, the corporate version. All right, so let's talk about then kind of what, what do we do with all this data, right? Because we obviously produce a lot of this data internally, and we do also use some third-party metrics as well. So there's a lot of different sort of purposes for this. You know, one of this is how you identify a universe, right? I'm only willing to invest in companies that score better or kind of, you know, higher on this level or that level. Um, another one is how you report to clients, that they understand that when you've told them that you have a sustainable investment, how do you justify that that is or is not the case? And as the regulators do circle the wagons, as already has been said, it's critically important to be able to evidence what you're doing and not just sort of say or market what you're doing. So these are some of the different kind of ways, you know, kind of systematic integration, defining a new universe, identifying sort of issues that can then lead to better engagement, healthier engagement. Again, analyzing a portfolio and fund reporting. So I'll show you just again a couple of the outputs here. This is one of them. Um, this is our own internal taxonomy. As already has been said, there are no global frameworks to say, 
you know, what does it really mean that there's an impact strategy or what does it mean that you have a, a sustainable driven versus, you know, just kind of ESG integrated. So we do use our tools and the data and kind of some of these measures to basically identify our own threshold for what it means for us. If you're, you know, going to be a, a portfolio manager at Schroeder's who wants to run an impact strategy, what are the criteria, what are the characteristics you have to meet at a minimum, you know, with your investments, it's sort of portfolio level, not portfolio level, excuse me, like issuer level analysis around impact, for example, and then kind of sustainable thematic. So what theme, you know, and this is where we do the, the theme alignment, our themex tool, and then sustainable driven is that next stage beyond just ESG integration to products that truly have some sort of outcome orientation around either sort of better, you know, environmental or social outcomes. So this is one. It's just kind of how we grade our homework in a sense so that we can show this to all internal and external stakeholders to say if we're naming a product sustainable, it is because of this criteria that's been met. Um, another thing clearly that we do is, is sort of client reporting. And again, our clients are some of the largest sort of big, you know, pension plans in the world, very sort of um, sophisticated institutions. And if you're saying to them that this is an integrated investment or it's a sustainable investment, they want to see evidence. And as Nikita said, this sort of correlation uh, between the external kind of providers is quite low. Um, and so this is a way that we at least have some um, you know, baseline, right? We say, uh, we use again that Sustainex tool and say what is the impact on people, on planet? Uh, we can slice it in many different ways. And again, it comes down to numbers. So we actually use a kind of a percent of, of, you know, basically company revenues that could be impacted based on their impact on people and planet if they had to bear the cost of those impacts themselves. And again, you know, for some portfolios, this can be at a portfolio level. If you're going to be much more um, rigorous, right, for an impact investment, for example, it's going to be at the individual investment, you know, individual company level um, that you're going to be looking at it. And then the last thing that we can do, and this is sort of my, my final slide, um, is we can diagnose portfolios. So a client can give us their portfolio, we can run it through our tools, and there's a number of different, there's a carbon value at risk tool, there's this Sustainex tool that I mentioned, a number of other tools that we can run an entire portfolio through and we can help folks kind of identify potential ESG risk before they crystallize, highlight misalignment between their ambitions and their outcomes, um, approximate a company's, again, net exposure to different ex externalities, and then kind of quantify those exposures to individual externalities or sustainability themes. And this has been especially helpful for our clients as they think about what is the roadmap for them. Um, around net zero, for example, again, I'll kind of end on this point because I know this is a decarbonization-focused conversation, is we do have a lot of clients who have made net zero commitments, and then it's a bit of, I don't want to say deer in the headlights, but sometimes it's a bit deer in the headlights, right? What do I do next? And so diagnosing the kind of the current situation is, is a good way to begin and say kind of here is where you have sort of risks that maybe are, are not um, identified and then how can we help you down your journey? What is it that you, that you need? Is it, again, more kind of climate positive investments? Is it, is it you know, um, you know uh, kind of uh, uh, adjusting the portfolio mix? You know, what is it that you need to kind of get you to where you want to be? And we can do the same thing, obviously, for social considerations as well because you do have three, three uh, letters in the ESG acronym. So I think that was, yeah, I think that was it. Um, and so I'm very happy to answer any questions, but again, Great. kind of a live example of how this works in practice. Thank you very much, Marina. Now we've had, oh, okay, another question right up here in the front. Please don't be shy or bashful. We've had three great presentations by people who've put up a lot of information on the screen. And let's, uh, let's make sure we ha understand what we're most focused on within their particular slide decks, for example. Yes, sir. Yes, Philip Proust, Energy Intelligence. Uh, I, I have a question about your voting policy. There's been, in the, in the last couple of years, a debate in the U.S. about climate resolutions that uh, some people say are being too prescriptive. So what, yeah. what's, your, what's yeah. your views on that? It's a really important point. Again, I, I don't want to, like, proselytize, but I think the focus on us as investors, and Nikita said it beautifully, you know, it is not our job to be an NGO. I, like her, have sustainability in my name and spend a lot of my time going through our kind of marketing documents and crossing out NGO language um, and asking marketing to take out NGO language because we are investors at the end of the day. So we do not consistently or kind of prescriptively vote on every kind of climate resolution positively. We don't necessarily say to companies you can no longer invest in fossil fuels. We have a coal policy, but it's quite specific. It's sort of companies that drive more than 20% of their revenues from thermal coal extraction, 
right, those things. And it's very, very predicated on financial risk and stranded asset risk. And I mean, we just don't, like, there's approximate risk with those businesses to our clients' portfolios, so we don't touch those businesses. But outside of that, we are much more inclined to engage than we are to, you know, exclude, and we have that same attitude in the voting. What we've done is we've actually published and we blog about, we're doing it right now during AGM season, we blog about um, kind of the shareholder resolutions that we vote on to include the climate focused resolutions. And we have a four prong approach, right, which one of which is, is this one of our kind of core themes? We have six themes that we engage on because you cannot be everything to everybody. You've got to focus on what's material to your clients. One of them, of course, is climate. One of them is nature and uh, biodiversity um, and natural capital. Um, and so we say, is this aligned to one of our priorities? The second thing we ask is, are we the right stakeholder? We are not always the right stakeholder. There are some things that a regulator should be focused on, right? So the investor is not always the right person. The third question, is the company already doing, like, enough, or not enough, but like, is the resolution really asking the company to do more than they're doing today? Because there are a lot of for show resolutions. Um, and we don't take part in for show resolutions, right? It's gotta be really additive. Um, and the last one is, are there unintended consequences? And I think on that sort of, you know, kind of basically saying to a company, okay, like a bank, no, no more invest, no, like no more funding any fossil fuel businesses today, full stop, I think has some serious unintended consequences and is not the way to go. And so we think about that four-prong approach each time, again, because we're not, you know, NGOs, um, we're not um, values oriented, we are investors and we're looking for companies to succeed. And so we have to work with management and understand kind of what their path of travel is. We have a very sort of uh, a very clear mandate uh, for companies around decarbonization of their businesses over time because we think that's the way that you can future-proof yourself given the, again, the direction of sort of policy and regulatory travel. Uh, but it's not about, you know, like I said, doing things that are unrealistic on day one. It's about sort of working with the business um, in their way to get where, wherever we, where we all need to go. Thank you for that question. We have another question. Yeah, this is Joy from K2 Integrity. So I have a question about like the benchmark. So I'm wondering like how do you determine the benchmark and is there any difference between the benchmark for different asset class, different investment sectors? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, I think in general, what we like to do is to benchmark against the, the broader indices, right? I know that there's now a rash of sort of sustainability benchmarks, but again, I think the function of some of our, our sort of proprietary tools is to give you that lens into what the portfolio is doing. At the end of the day, what we're trying to deliver for clients, especially in the integrated strategies, is just better performance because we are 100% active asset managers. And so if you're investing with us in a global equity product or a global bond or, you know, emerging market equities, we're trying to deliver alpha. There's no excuse, right? Well, you know, it's ESG, so therefore you have to take a hit. We, we don't want that. And so we tend to sort of benchmark against the broader index. Where you have impact, right, or where you have sustainable strategies, again, kind of, you know, identified as sustainable, um, there are in some cases sort of sustainable benchmarks that we can look at. Uh, but I think in most cases we would prefer that clients sort of look at us against the broader index and then look at the sustainability metrics as we present them in all the reporting, you know, based on, again, the kind of raw da data and then how we, we sort of analyze using our tools. So at the end of the day, again, these are investments, right? They're supposed to make money, um, even the impact side. Um, and then you have to also see here's the return and here is the kind of social environmental characteristics and where you've contributed, again, to positive impact. So it's kind of looking at those two things side by side. But because a lot of the kind of indices, the sustainable indices uh, and benchmark are still quite nascent, and just like anything else from third party, we have a lot of concern about the kind of look through and the black box, and do we really understand what's underneath there, I think we'd be less inclined, unless the client wants that, to sort of propose that as a benchmark ourselves. Thank you, Thank Moreno. You. I think we have time for one more quick question. We've got about 30 seconds to answer it, okay? Oh, it says two minutes, but okay. <laughs> Hi there. Thank you for your uh, presentation. I'm Murray Collins. I run a, a company, a satellite data analytics company called Space Intelligence. I'm very curious when you mentioned decarbonization investments, if you're investing in nature-based solutions or natural climate yeah. solutions. Thank you. Thank you. I did not plant him in the audience, but uh, last year Schroeder's published our plan for nature. Uh, we were up at COP15 as well. We're actually, I think, I think the first, frankly, large asset manager to have gone down this path uh, so rigorously. We were just named number one in um, Forest 500 sort of um, list of, of asset managers, you know, who are uh, focused on, on deforestation, for example. And so with Conservation International, we've launched, uh, a, you know, an investment alpha called Acaria. 
um, out of Asia where we are actively investing in nature positive solutions. So uh, um, sustainable agriculture, uh, regenerative uh, forestry, uh, conservation, and so forth. And so we've really begun that, as I said, kind of in, in, in Asia, but I, I, I hope and intend for it to grow for us all over the world, and I'm certainly excited to bring it to U.S. clients here. There's so many worthy projects, frankly, right here in North America for us to take on on behalf of North American clients. It's an exciting future around nature investing for us. Great. Thank you so much, Marina, for your remarks. Really appreciate it. And